stand and worship with us.
was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in his For the earth.
something before we sing this song, this chorus one more time. We've been cleaning out my parents' garage. I know that's random. Somebody stopped by to pick up a bunch of stuff. He told me that he um, went from being Christian to being Muslim and then back to ancient Egyptian religion because he figured out that if people could figure out how to build the pyramids, that they must know something about God and how to get ahead in life. And I was just playing worship music as we were cleaning out the garage and we started to play this one song that sings from uh, Revelation 1 that says, Worthy is the Lamb, unto the Lamb be glory and honor and praise. And the man, he just looked up to heaven with a twinkle in his eye and he said, that song, it sounds familiar to me. I don't know if it's the melody or if it's the words. And he just said to me, it sounds so familiar. The reason why that song was familiar to that man is because that is the song that every human ever created was born to sing. That is because that is the song of the righteous ones, of the redeemed ones that are singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. That is a song that you and I are invited to sing this morning on Resurrection Sunday, worthy is the Lamb, to receive honor and power and glory. That is the song of our hearts, of our souls this morning. And I invite you to sing it along with us. If you know Jesus or if not, that's the song that you were born to sing this morning. So we're gonna lift that up and we're gonna sing all hail King Jesus, the Lord, the Savior of all. Sunday. I want to extend a special welcome to those, of course, here in the house, and of course, to our online family watching us online as well. Church, can we make some noise for those watching us online? Show some love for them. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. And listen, we believe no matter what's taking place in this week, no matter how you got here today, we believe in all our hearts that you are in the right place. You're in the right place today. 
If we haven't yet met, my name is Dave, and I have the honor of serving on staff here at Kingsway Church. I'd just like to bring to your attention a few things. First and foremost, if you have children and babies with you today, we are so glad they are here joining us as well. And we just want to remind you that if for some reason during the service that maybe one of your children gets a little bit fussy or begins to make a little bit of a scene, we do have several opportunities for you to enjoy and watch a service in comfort and comfort. We have our kids way ministries rocking and rolling in all three areas. We have preschool, nursery, and elementary school all happening and taking place right now, led by an amazing team of leaders and volunteers. And we also have a comfort room located downstairs that streams the service live and has some comfortable seating for you as well. So if you need any assistance with that going forward or any time in our service today, we just want to invite you to ask any of our ushers located in the back, and they will love to point you in the right direction. Hey, I know we say this every single week, but we have a King's Way Church app, and I want to make a personal invitation to those of you here, especially if it's your first or second time, to go to the app store and type in King's Way Church and download our app. We believe it's one of the best ways that we can connect with you, care for you, and of course, get any updated information that you feel comfortable giving. Listen, we promise this. We're not going to call you. We're not going to show up at your house. We're not going to bug you. We just want to know the best way that we can care for you. And sometimes that's by updating information or telling us a story of what God is doing in your life. So we encourage you to download the Kingsway Church app. On the app, we also have something called a connection card. And on that connection card, there's a section located for prayer requests. I know we say this a lot, but we want to remind you of the power of prayer. But every single Tuesday as we meet as a staff in our staff chapel, we lift up every single request that comes in via prayer. Not one request that is submitted is not prayed over. Not one. So if you need prayer for anything taking place in your life at all, we just want to encourage you and invite you to fill out that prayer request on your connection card. And we as a church would love to lift up whatever is going on in your life to the Lord together. And last but not least, we do something here at Kingsway that we like to call Growth Track. And we believe that Growth Track is one of the best ways for you to discover and develop your God-given purpose. If you have questions about our church, if you want to take a next step in your life, or if you have any questions about the ministries that we offer here, or better yet, for how you can get involved, we want to invite you. Our next step for you is to attend Growth Track. Now, typically, we have Growth Track that takes place in a three-week session after our noon service, but you have a special opportunity on April 18th. It's a Tuesday night at 6 p.m. where we're having a Growth Track intensive, where you're going to be able to attend all three Growth Track sessions in one time. So if you want to come in and discover your purpose, if you want to meet some people, have great community together, we just want to invite you to attend Grow Track. And again, that's April 18th at 6 p.m. right here at Kingsway at our Cherry Hill campus. Amen? All right, why don't you guys do this? Why don't you grab a seat and on your way back down, I wish three people around you a very happy Easter.
mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. to be together on this Resurrection Sunday. And as you're seated, I hope that you sense what God is not only up to, but also what he's wanting to do in each of our lives. And uh, come on, how about one more time? Can we just thank Jesus for his presence? Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone. I want to welcome all those that are joining us online too. And uh, so glad that we could be together in the building. So good to see you. I see a lot of people dressed up today, looking good. I mean, pulled out the nice dress. Some people even ironed today. Whew. 
I was talking to someone who was dressed very nicely, one of our KLS students actually, before this service. And I said, Cammie, you look so nice. She's, and she grew up in the Midwest. She said, my Midwest friends call Easter church prom. I said, you know what? That's, that's pretty good. I'm going to use it. So I'm using it. I thought that was good. I never heard that. I was like, I like that. So uh, whatever it might be and whatever you're wearing, we're just glad you're here. And uh, it's exciting to be together on this day. All that it means for us as followers of Jesus and uh, looking forward to encouraging you from God's word. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, you can uh, meet me in John chapter 20. We'll get there in a few moments. As always, the verses will be on the screens for us too. And uh, we just have a little something for you, one for each family as you leave today. It's just a little magnet that is uh, a replica of, a, of the painting that you saw on the way in. And that's been on the screens for Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and today Easter. It doesn't matter if you miss Palm Sunday or Good Friday or you were at all three of them. Uh, make sure that your family grabs one. And it's a way to just commemorate what we've been thinking about and the Jesus that we've been worshiping over the last couple of weekends uh, you'll notice that stroke of green on there is for Palm Sunday. As Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem to begin Passion Week, uh, they were waving those palm branches shouting, save us, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And uh, we talked about that last Sunday. And then two days ago, powerful Good Friday services. If you were with us uh, online or in person, uh, incredible time reflecting on what Jesus did for us on the cross, and that's um, noted here by the red and the blood of Jesus that signifies the passion of the Christ. And then today we have a streak of purple across there that you already saw, and that's uh, symbolic of the conquering and reigning King Jesus. Amen. Royalty. He is king. He's king over death, over hell and the grave, so we celebrate that. I want you to grab one of those on the way out today. So last Sunday, we talked about um, this, this parade into the city of Jerusalem. Friday, we talked about the passion. And today, I want to tell you why and lead us through the story of the resurrection to help us understand our praise, that our praise is a response to everything that Jesus did for us on Good Friday and a couple of days later on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And today is foundational to everything that we who profess Christ, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've surrendered your life to him and you've made him the Lord of your life, this day is foundational to our faith. I mean, it's like the deal, right? And so much so that Paul said this, the Apostle Paul said this in Corinthians, he said, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, our preaching would be useless and so would our faith. In fact, if Jesus didn't walk out of that grave on Easter Sunday morning, then everything we're doing today, we could just close up shop, head out to dinner, and you have a great week, right? Like, it would be pointless. In fact, everything we do every weekend that we come together and we worship and we serve and we give and we do life together, all of that would be pointless if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. So when I think about that, I think of Man, that would certainly be disappointing, right, to say the least. And when I think about disappointment, I think of how many different shapes and sizes disappointment came in. Now, I won't ask the question how many of you have ever been disappointed because I would hope every hand in here and those online would go up. We've all been disappointed. But we know that dis disappointment comes in all kinds of different packages and experiences just like it comes in different shapes and sizes, what I mean by that is when we have an expectation of how something's supposed to happen, at least in our mind, and then it doesn't live up to that, we experience something that falls short of the expectation, there's this gap of what we could call frustration or disappointment. And disappointment, as it creeps its way into our life, we realize that, man, it could be something big time in our life, like a job falling through. It could be, a, it could be even as disappointing as you start in a job one week and a week later, you're like, it's not what I thought it was. I'm resigning, right? And it could be maybe that vacation rental that looks so good on the computer as you were looking at those pictures. Anybody ever had this experience? And then you show up there and your wife looks at you and is like, I'm not sleeping on that bed. <laughs> That'd be disappointment. And a major headache as well, right? Well, disappointment comes in all different ways to us. But I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way. The resurrection story starts with disappointment. Do you know that? It starts with disappointment. It starts with Mary who comes to the tomb. We're going to pick the story up in John 20 here. And, and realizes that she did not get what she had been expecting. Gospel of John, he says it this way. He says, early on Sunday morning, this is chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. We're going to make our way through this chapter. 
While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She was not expecting that. Disappointment. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John who's authoring this gospel. And she said, they've taken the body of the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the, disciple, the other disciple, John's talking of himself at, out round Peter. He just wanted us to know he won the foot race, right? That was important in his mind. And he reached the tomb first, but he stooped and he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings were lying there, but he didn't go in. And verse six tells us, then Simon Peter arrived. He went inside and he also noticed the linen wrappings that were lying there. While the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, he also went in and he saw and believed. And here's verse 9. For until then, they still hadn't understand the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Now think about that for a moment. These guys have been walking with Jesus for a little over three years. They saw him teach. They saw him do miracles. They were there and part of the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitudes, the 5,000 plus. In fact, as Jesus broke the bread and the fish and gave it out, he didn't give it directly to the people. He gave it to the disciples so the miracle funneled through them. So they were part of this. And they still didn't get their mind around all that Jesus meant when he said, I must die and be raised on the third day until the moment that at least for Peter and John, they're in this empty tomb and they're like, oh, now it clicks. This is everything that Jesus was talking about these last couple of years as we traveled around the surrounding areas of Jerusalem and Galilee and we watched him perform miracles and he would teach us and we would look at him sideways when he would tell us that I have to be crucified and then raised back to life and in this moment even though there's disappointment that his body's not in the tomb certainly on Mary's part first and then to the wonder and amazement of John and Peter they realize that all oh, this is what Jesus has been trying to tell us Maybe you're like the disciples, and honestly, a little bit like myself, that sometimes it takes us even up to three years to believe. It might take us a while or have to have heard it numerous times for us to get our mind around what Jesus is saying was actually true, and then wrapping our heart around it and believing it. And here's what I want you to hear today, that because the tomb is empty, your life can be full. Mary ran to that tomb and then went and got Peter and John. All of them experiencing something different. And at the same time, this common thought of Jesus should be there. He's just been dead these couple of days. And now the stones rolled away and his body's not there. And because of that empty tomb, we can have a full life. If you rewind 10 chapters back, Jesus is teaching the disciples and the crowds. And he says in John 10, 10, that the thief or the enemy, the devil himself comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And then he tells the crowds, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the what? To the full. I've come that you wouldn't just have life or experience it on some low grade level, but that you would have an abundant, overflowing, joy filled life. Now he never promised a life free from pain or suffering or sorrow or heartache. But he said that he would do something much greater internally inside of our lives that even though the tomb is empty, it's in fact because it is that he can give the full life that he was talking about just 10 chapters before in the Gospel of John. And I don't know if you've ever kind of couched it in these terms in your mind or have heard it presented this way, but the disappointment of the empty tomb actually was what caused them to rejoice. It's the thing that 2,000 years later we still celebrate because Jesus did everything that he promised he would do by walking out of that grave. It's changed the game, not just then for the disciples and for the early church that we hear chronicled in the book of Acts, but also for us all these years and centuries later. But here's the thing about the empty tomb. It's full of guarantees. It's full of guarantees. Let me just mention a couple of them to us on this Easter Sunday morning. The first one is this, that because the tomb is empty, every tear can be wiped dry. Did you know that? You, you might have walked in or logged on today and, and, and you've been experiencing even a season recently of, of tears, of mourning, of sorrow, of great disappointment perhaps. Things that you expected to happen that have not become reality in your life and you're not sure if Jesus is even aware of those things. 
You know because you have relationship with him or you've heard others tell you that he is present. He's a present help in the time of trouble, but you haven't fully experienced him in that sense or seen him working in the current situation. And I just want to remind us today that, listen, on this Resurrection Sunday, that because the tomb remains empty, that every tear, Jesus has the power to wipe away. And there's something about our tears that also invites him in. And you say, well, where does that happen in this story? Well, we're going to read through these couple of groupings and watch the guarantees just kind of rise to the surface. So we go back to verse 11. Mary comes back to the tomb and it says this. She's standing outside the tomb crying. Just in case you weren't convinced that she was crying, it says as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw that there were two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus was lying. Now, some of us have heard the story so many times it does nothing to like creep us out. But if you put yourself in the story for a moment, you're coming at looking for the savior that you've been following and that in Mary's case had, had freed her and delivered her from seven demons, the stories in the gospels. Now she comes and Jesus is gone. So she's weeping, she's crying, and then she sees these two angels. That's pretty freaky if you think about it. Dear woman, they ask her, why are you crying? Because they've taken my Lord away, she replied, and I don't know where they've placed him. But she turned to leave and she saw the crowd standing there. She saw, uh, she, I'm sorry, she, saw, she turned around and, she, and saw someone standing there and it was Jesus, but she didn't even recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? So now Jesus asked her, he says, who are you looking for? But she thought he was the gardener. And she said to him, sir, they've taken him away. Tell me where they've put him and, and I'll go and get him, right? So let's just kind of pause there for just a moment. Mary's unaware because she's so worked up and understandably so. She's crying and weeping and has already been addressed by these two angelic beings. And then she's going to leave the tomb and it's Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. And here's the truth that I think is sandwiched and packed in that story for us, that sometimes, even in our most painful moments, knowing that Jesus is accessible to us, we miss him because of how real the tears are. She turned around and thought he was someone else. She had been part of his ministry, watched him free her and save her and do a dynamic work in her life for the last several years. And now she turns around thinking it's the gardener and she says, would you just tell me where he is and I'll go and get him. And then Jesus speaks one word to her. It's not peace, it's not hope, it's not maybe. He calls her by name and he says, Mary, Mary. And in that moment, she recognizes his voice and his presence. And I would just submit to us, there are times in our lives where sometimes we can't recognize what God is doing right in front of us. But if we'll pause long enough to hear his voice call our name, it can absolutely change the way we see everything in front of us. He said, Mary. And then she responds with, oh, Rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher. Yeah, you're the one who she remembers back to everything he taught her. And the moment he calls her name, it comes to life in her. Jesus has the potential and the power to erase every tear. And here's the thing that's amazing about tears. We see it throughout the scriptures. Our tears don't chase Jesus away. In fact, they attract him. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 34, verse 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those who are crushed in spirit, right? So you might find yourself even at a place now in life and you were invited out today or you came and maybe you come every week or whatever the case might be for you and, and, and your family, but you find yourself in a place where you're just, you're broken and you're hurting and, and things are not like you expected them to be and there's great disappointment. And I'm just telling you one word from Jesus. In fact, him just calling your name and enables him to wipe away every tear from your eye because it's our brokenheartedness and it's our crushed spirit that doesn't shun Jesus, but actually invites him in. You know that broken hearts and contrite spirits always get the attention of the Lord every single time. He calls Mary by name. And that's the promise. One of the guarantees of the empty tomb is that he wipes away every tear. And here's another just as equally, equally as powerful thought that because the tomb is empty, that he can help um, take every fear and give you the sense of being able to overcome it. Because the, the tomb is empty, every fear can be overcome. Every single fear. Some of us came in today and we're full of fear. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you might have to mask that or hide that a little bit. You might feel like you're at a place in your life where, where I, I'm not supposed to have fear and it's kind of crept in. Listen, the Bible doesn't promise us that fears won't come in. What Jesus commands throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is, hey, in that fear, you don't have to let it grip you because I'm with you. 
You don't have to let it grip you. You don't have to let it control our lives. So say, well, where's that in the story, Phil? I'm so glad you asked. Let's go down to verse 19 through 21. That's Sunday night. So this is Easter evening, right? This is after today, after you meet and have family over and all the eggs are open and baskets are torn through, right? This is Sunday evening. Think of yourself in the story. And then it says this, they were meeting, the disciples were meeting, right? We heard Mary's story. Now watch this. The disciples are meeting, get this phrase, behind locked doors. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Because they thought, hey, these guys are connected to Jesus. They've been following him these last few years. Remember they put guards after they rolled the stone in place, after they put him in the tomb, for fear that someone might come and steal him and then give a report that he's come back to life? Well, Jesus did that all on his own. (laughs) And now the disciples are afraid and they're behind locked doors because they don't want to be blamed for stealing his body and causing a show. And then Jesus, watch this, is standing there among them. Like it doesn't say Jesus walked in the door or he knocked or he snuck in through a window. It just says Jesus appeared right there, right? And if that didn't spook them enough, he goes, hey guys, peace be with you, right? As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hand and the wound in his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he says to them, peace be with you. Now, we know anytime we see in Scripture repetition, certainly just a couple of verses apart, that there's a, a, an opportunity for us to pause and go, what is Jesus driving at? He understood that they were worked up. He understood that they, like Mary, had been walking side by side with him for the last three years, and fear had settled into their hearts. And I wonder for us today, how many of us, even as followers of Jesus, live behind locked doors because we're not quite sure if Jesus will come through on every promise he's made. We're a little afraid that we'll have to stand up and be a witness for him, and we don't know what to say. We're afraid of other people accusing us, or aren't you the ones that follow Jesus and, and, and maybe throw shade at us or, 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 or accuse us of certain um, belief systems that are really not true to God's word or the way that we would go about our faith. You could, you could fill in the blank whatever you want with whatever you want there, but many times we let fear grip our lives and we stay behind closed doors. But if you go all the way back to the first book of the Bible in Genesis, all the way through Revelation, more than 300 times God tells us, do not fear. One of the first places we see it is in Genesis 26 when Isaac, Abraham's son, is, is, is journeying about and he's, he's really trying to fulfill the call of God on his life. And, and the Lord tells him, he says, listen, don't be afraid for I am with you. That I am with you follows in almost every instance, do not fear. Because what God is wanting to say then is the same thing he's trying to convey to us today in 2023, that you don't have to fear and you can know that I'm with you, that I'm with you. Peace be with you. Jesus wasn't just saying some artificial sense of peace because you remember the prophet Isaiah called Jesus the prince of what? So what Jesus is saying is I'm with you. He wasn't just saying like, hey, peace, peace, right? Like just peace, figure it out on your, no, 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 no. Because I'm with you, there's peace. There's peace available. Here, here's a final guarantee that if you haven't been able to relate to the first two of every tier has the ability to be wiped dry and every fear has the ability to be overcome. Maybe it's this one you can connect with because the tomb is empty. Every doubt can be relieved. Every doubt. With a room this size and however many people are joining us online, here's what I know. There are at least some of us in here that know the truth. We may have even experienced Jesus to a certain extent in our lives, but there's still some doubt that creeps in. And I want to just say this to dispel the myth that when we doubt, Jesus runs away. He's never threatened by your doubt. Not once. Not once does your doubt threaten Jesus. It doesn't leave him incapable of meeting you right where you are. It doesn't leave him impotent in the sense of being able to powerfully impact your life. It doesn't leave him out in the distance going, well, I'm never going to be able to get near to them until they remove doubt. In fact, sometimes we, like the disciples, have to see in order to believe. And it's found in the same story that we've been reading. Look at these last few verses in John 20, verse 24. says this, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, who's nicknamed the twin, I'm sure he preferred to go by that name because now we know him as Doubting Thomas. Poor guy got a bad rap one time in scripture. The guy walked with Jesus for three years and one time, right? He was not with the others when Jesus had come the first time. 
And they told him, they come back to Thomas and they said, listen, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, listen to his words. He said, I won't believe it unless I see the wounds in his hands and I put my fingers into them and I place my fingers and my hand into the wound in his side. So eight days later, the disciples were together again. This is Easter. So we fast forward eight days, two Mondays later, the disciples are together again. This time Thomas is with them. The doors were locked. This has become a habit now. But Jesus also has a habit. Suddenly, as before, he's standing among them. He just comes into the room. We don't know of him unlocking any doors or walking in. The Holy Spirit inspired John to tell him, us today that Jesus was standing among them. And what does he say again? Peace. I'm peace. Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm the Prince of Peace. I, I, I am with you, he said. He doesn't ever feel threatened by our doubt. And then he invites, watch this, he invites Thomas and offers him the very proof that Thomas is asking for in order to believe. Even though Thomas, like the other disciples, had been side by side with Jesus over the last several years, again, watching him perform miracles, watching him raise Lazarus from the dead, watching him feed the multitudes, watching him heal the sick, bring sight back to blind eyes, bring the ability to walk back to lame. Thomas was there for all of that. But he looks at Thomas, Jesus does, and he says, put your finger here. Touch the wounds in my hand that you're talking about that you needed for proof. And then put your hand, Thomas, in my side. Feel the wound that was there. And then he says this, but don't be faithless any longer. Here's what's incredible. You remember what he did for Mary? He gave her one word. He called her name. For Thomas, in Luke's version of the story, he says one word, believe. See, he's not threatened by his doubt. In fact, Jesus extends an invitation that it's okay to doubt, but now that I've given you proof that it's me, your Lord, who has come back to life, I need you, as a command, I need you to believe. I need you to believe, Thomas. You can put your hope in me. And I, and I just want you to know that because the tomb is still empty, it's proof for us today that every doubt that creeps into our lives, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're just checking him out, every doubt can be relieved by the one who is the prince of peace. That's the beauty and the joy and the victory of the empty tomb. And then I love this, verse 28. Listen to what Thomas says. The Bible says that he exclaimed to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Say, so what's so significant about that? I think there's something important in the order there. He didn't say, notice this, he did not say, Thomas did not say, my God and my Lord. He said, my Lord and my God. Meaning this, that first I need to now surrender and make you the master of my life. I believe that you are my God. I believe that you are creator. I believe that you are recreator. I walk the streets of the towns and I seen you heal people and I confessed you as God. But now, Jesus, I see that you're Lord and I yield and surrender my life to you as the master of my life. Why? Because I know that you've offered me proof that everything you promised you would do on the other side of the cross, you've already accomplished. And because the tomb is empty, every tear is wiped away. Every fear can be overcome and every doubt can be silenced or relieved. You say, well, that, so that's great. That's a, that's a cute Easter story. And I get how it means something to Mary and to Peter and John, the rest of the disciples. I get how it impact Thomas thinking and certainly transformed his life to get him to a place to say, my Lord and my God. But what does that mean for me? Did he really rise from the dead for me? Like we sang about today, like we're here to celebrate today. Well, Paul answers that question for us in his second letter to the church in Corinth. He says that he, meaning Jesus, died for everyone died for everyone. You know who's part of that everyone? Yeah, all of us. Let's make it personal. You are. I am. Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive his new life, watch this, will no longer live for themselves. That's the my Lord statement that Thomas made. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised. Watch this, just in case you were doubting, for them. He did it for them that everybody who would put their faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus says he would raise them to new life. That the same spirit that rose Jesus up from the grave on that resurrection Sunday is available to us to live and dwell and function inside of each one of our lives. 
That's why Easter is so incredible. That's why the disappointment of the empty tomb means so much for living a full life now. You see, the power of the resurrection story is in something they didn't find. It's in something they never found. They were looking for Jesus' body, but he wasn't in the grave. The tomb was empty, and the tomb is still empty. You won't find him there. So in a moment, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll get to worship the Lord in a final couple of ways here to close out. But before we pray, I don't know if you picked up on this story. There's some other interesting themes. There's a lot of looking, and there's a lot of running. Mary gets to the tomb and she looks in and sees Jesus isn't there. She runs back to Peter and John and then they have a race. John points out because it's important to him to let us know <laughs> that he won the foot race. He gets there, but he doesn't go in. Peter looks in the tomb and then walks in. After John sees Peter do that after running, they, he goes in. He looks in the tomb and then they run back and tell the other. There's a lot of looking and running. And I just want to let you know this, friends. There's a lot of looking and searching still going on in the world today. We're looking to see, people are hungry to see if Jesus really is who he said he was. And the proof of the empty tomb is more than enough to guarantee that because that tomb is empty, your life can absolutely be full. Full of hope, full of joy, full of faith, full of peace, and full of the life that Jesus promised that he came to give. So I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with me. I'm going to pray for us, and then Dave will come, and we'll close out service in a couple of moments. But listen, as we're here, as heads bowed, eyes are closed, you say, why do we do that? This is a moment that I believe is sacred and between you and God for you to really just close out everything else going on around you and let the word of God that was delivered to us today through the gospel of John find a place in our heart. Because we have information now and maybe perhaps hearing something in a first time or in a way we haven't heard it before and we're responsible now with that information. And I say that to you to let you know this, that all the looking that was, run, that was going on in that text into the tomb and looking for a savior to come and visit his body that wasn't there, the running to get to the disciples, the running back to the tomb. Listen, we look and we look and we look and it's in Jesus that hope and life is found. And maybe today you find yourself running in a hundred different directions and there's only one direction ultimately to run to find life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to God, the Father, except by coming through me. So you can run to him today. You can run to him with tears in your eyes. You can run to him with fear filling your heart. You can run to him with doubts wreaking havoc in your mind and Jesus will welcome you and I wonder if your response would be like Thomas's was my Lord my master and my God you know it's one thing for us to acknowledge Jesus as the savior of the world I would I would venture to guess that most people in this room wouldn't have a problem saying Jesus is savior but confessing him as Lord is a totally different ballgame it's surrendering our right of control in our lives to him so that he can wipe away the tears, so that he can overcome the fear, so that he can calm the doubt. And if you're here today or you're with us online and you say, you know what, Phil, that's me. I, I, I know Jesus as Savior. I understand what he did. I'm, I'm all about the resurrection. I'm in on the empty tomb, but I've never surrendered my life to him. I've never called him Lord. I've never given him control. I've never released that to him in my life, and I want to do that today. I want to experience the fullness that the empty tomb is symbolic of. If that's you today, I'm not going to ask you to stand or come forward. The intention's not to embarrass you. I would just love in this prayer for salvation to include you in it. But if you say, that's me today, I want to surrender my life to Jesus and make him the Lord of my life. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand and let me know that's you. I'd love to include you in this prayer. I'm all around the room. God bless you. It's awesome. Amen. One in the back, in the balcony. God bless you. Awesome. On the floor. Yeah. God bless you. Three, four hands, five hands. Thank you. Praise God. Yeah. You can put your hands down. Let me, let me lead us in this prayer. You don't have to repeat after me. And all you need to do is pray something like this. It's not my words that are important. It's always the posture of our heart. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I recognize that what you did on the cross that we celebrate this weekend was on my behalf. 
And Lord, I repent. I turn from my sins and I put my faith and trust in you that what you did on the cross on Good Friday was in place of me. Because my sin should have put me on the cross, but you took that punishment for me. And God, we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, as we repent and turn from our sins, we turn towards you. We put our hope and faith in Jesus. And Lord, I'm asking this in accordance with your word, that your Holy Spirit right now would rush into every heart that's confessing you as Lord in this moment. Lord, that you would give them a strong assurance of your free gift of salvation, that every tear would be wiped away, that every fear would be overcome, and that every doubt would be relieved in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those that made that decision? Amen. Amen. Well, listen, to those that raise their hands here in the room, or maybe you raise your hand online, we just want to say that we as a church, we are so proud of you. And please, please, please don't leave this place without letting somebody know. You can do that in a few ways. You can mark it off on your connection card, whether it's on the app or on the physical connection card located outside the double doors on the table as you leave today. Or you can see our Next Steps team. They are located at the Next Steps wall in the atrium when you leave here today. We just believe that life is better done so much more in community together than in isolation. So if you raise your hand today, let somebody know. If you're watching us online, let one of our online moderators know as well. And we'd love to connect with you and give you some next steps for your faith journey. And speaking of next steps, we want to remind you, church, that if you have any questions at all about your personal faith journey, about the ministries we have offered here, or just basic general questions about our church, we invite you to go see our Next Steps team again, located at the Next Steps wall as well. There's an amazing team of volunteers that are trained and excited to connect with you. I'm going to ask you guys to stand to your feet at this time. We're going to remain in an atmosphere of worship as we prepare to honor the Lord's tithes and offerings together. We want to say a resounding thank you for honoring what God is doing by giving your first fruits and trusting the Lord to meet your finances. Listen, if you're a first time guest here, we don't expect you or obligate you to give it all. We're just so happy you're here. But if you do want to give, we know that most of our church gives online. You can see in the QR code, it's going to appear behind me as well. You can do it on our Kingsway Church app or on our website. Or if you have a physical donation, you can drop it off in the baskets towards the back as well. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward at this time as well. As Kate and the team lead us in one more song of worship together, we just want to invite you that if you need anything at all in your life and to go to the Lord over, if you need prayer for anything at all, we just want to invite you to come forward and see one of our amazing prayer team members. I know it might seem a little bit awkward, maybe a little bit scary, but this is what our prayer team is here for. They are here to lift up whatever requests going on in your life to the Lord together. So I'm just going to pray over to Offering Church. I'm going to pray over us today as we leave and celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to transition our service afterwards. So Jesus, we just say thank you once again for what today means to us. Thank you for rising, Jesus, out of the grave to conquer death. For you have overcome the grave. And in doing so, you've given us every reason to overcome any situation that we are currently going through. I lift up the offering to you right now. I just pray you continue to bless the gift and the giver. God, we know you are using this money. You are multiplying it. You are using it to change lives. And we thank you so much that we get to partner with you and see that come full fold. Jesus, we love you. We give you our time and our hearts today. We ask all these things in your mighty name. Amen.
pray you have a great rest of your day, and we we'll hope to see you next week. God bless you, church. Oh,